Welcome everybody to the KB Music Den. I'm Brad, as always, and you are. I am oh. Fables of the Reconstruction. That's who I am. <laughs> That's a pretty fascinating <laughs> shirt you got there. <laughs> well, it, isn't it interesting, right? It is. Well, what are we doing today? Well, you know, I don't know. I just happened to be, I rolled out of bed in this shirt. I mean, it's just to total coincidence. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it looks like Discnology, uh, the third uh, installment for REM, their third album, Fables of the Reconstruction, Brad. That's where we're at. That's where Where's we are. So Here we go. Yeah, so we've done Murmur, we've done Reckoning, so folks go back and check those out if you missed them. Um, we also, a while back, did a ranking of all the albums, so, and like we said, we might do a redux of that after yeah, all this. We're going to have to, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, so, I am particularly interested in doing this album, um, because... Because you have a shirt. Well, because I have the shirt. Now, the funny thing is, I got this <laughs> shirt... Um, and you would think I have a shirt with this album cover because it must be among, if not my favorite REM album. You would think most people would get the cover shirt, you know, their favorite album. Um, I, I love the artwork of this. Yeah. You know, I, I really do. Um, so the album itself, we will get into. Um, sure. Now, I know that it's not just us because, like I said, there was Murmur, there was Reckoning. Um, this was often viewed as the difficult third album. Um, and it always sounded quite different to me than the first two. Mm -hmm. And I, I never quite put my finger on why until I did some of the research that I like to do for this series. Um, I, I, it shouldn't have surprised me at all that they switched to a different producer for this album. Oh, you can hear that. Yeah, <laughs> you can hear that. <laughs> Um, so Mitch Easter and Don Dixon uh, were gone. Now, um, one of them had a band. I think it was called uh, off the top of my head. I think it was called let's active. Um, and they were about to do some stuff. So they weren't available. One of the guys wasn't available. Um, so they ended up finding uh, Joe Boyd to produce the album. Now uh, I have a book. I don't I have it upstairs, but if, if I showed you a picture of Joe Boyd, honestly, he looks more like he'd be their accountant than a producer, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but Hey, you know um, now it was interesting to me to learn that, Joe Boyd had uh, done some work with, which really spoke to Peter Buck, especially um, done some work in the past with Nick Drake and uh, Fairpoint Convention, a lot of the great folk artists. So and that does come through in the music, which we'll talk about. Yeah. Um, but Brad, did you know that a couple of the people that were in the running or at least in the discussions for stepping in and producing the third REM album were none other than Elvis Costello? Oh, oh. Now, imagine how that would have turned out. Boy, that'd been interesting. Yeah. Um, and uh, Van Dyke Parks, who was a, a primary lyricist for uh, Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys. Yeah. So I thought that was interesting to learn. It is interesting. And another thing I think about with all this, too, is that it's kind of like a what if. Like, what if Easter and Dixon, schedule-wise, were able to stay in the mm -hmm. camp and do a third album with R.E.M.? It makes you wonder yeah. what that would have sounded like. Um, but that being said, you know, I, I think, uh, not to be corny, but I think things happen for a reason. Um, and I, you know, I can't imagine the story of this band and their discography without this album. I really can't, yeah. um, especially after diving in more closely. Um, now the album was recorded in North London, which was a, a kind of quite a different thing for them coming from Athens, Georgia. Um, and Peter Buck was uh, quoted as saying, if it wasn't snow, it was sleet or rain. <laughs> so it was kind of a gloomy mm -hmm. setting. <laughs> um, now the band, they do recall this being a difficult album to make. Uh, they came in with very few, hardly any ideas that they were excited about, uh, which is a very opposite of what happened with Reckoning. They had road tested some of those songs like South Central Rain, for example, on the tour. Yeah. From and they knew, like uh, I quoted Bill Berry in the last episode, he said, you know, I knew we had the goods. We had the songs going into the studio where for this album, you know, from what I researched, they were uh, kind of road weary, kind of burnt out. Uh, they were kind of getting on each other's nerves a little bit. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, Peter Buck even said in an interview, you know, we were miserable and we were at, at times we were kind of mean to each other. Um, 
So it just sets an interesting, uh, you know, paints an interesting picture for how the music, you know, may, may have affected the music. Um, Rolling Stone interviewed Stipe before the album's release. And when he was asked what the album would, you know, was going to sound like, he replied, and I quote, it reminds me of two oranges being stuck together with a nail. Is that what you hear when you hear this album? I, I was leaning towards lemons, but yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well played, my friend. Uh, now, he later said it was just a flip answer because he was tired and he just said made something up. Um, but, um, you know, now as we're talking about uh, the album overall and then we get into the songs like we do with this. Um, but uh, Joe Boyd, the producer that ended up actually producing this album, uh, recalls that it was hard to zero in on an ideal mix for the album because, and this is the opposite of what you usually hear with bands, both Stipe and Buck kept insisting that their parts be turned down, not up. <laughs> that's not a good, yeah, that's a bad. Yeah, it's usually the opposite, you know. Yeah. You know, everybody's like, you know, with the musicians, uh, you know, oh. I want to, I, I love me some more me, you know. Yeah. Um, with this one, they were like, oh, turn me down, turn me down. Um, so that's kind of interesting. But before we go song by song, uh, you know, coming from Murmur, then Reckoning, like I've said, um, this one, Fables of the Reconstruction, kind of what were your thoughts before you did this deep dive and the kind of generally where are you now after living with it a bit more this, this past week or so? Certainly. I mean, for me, this was probably out of their discography, the least known album to me as far as listened to, understood, absorbed. I didn't, this album always kind of just got skipped in my head. I mean, I've heard it, but this is one that I haven't stayed with long. Mm -hmm. um, and, and upon sitting with it again, the production thing is an interesting fact because that's the first thing you notice is how different it sounds in yeah. the first two albums. Now, you mentioned Costello, that bums me out because I would have loved to heard what he would have done with this album because this would have had a different sound with Costello at the album. And, and just from the songs and the songwriting, it seems like an album that he might have had a really interesting touch on. Absolutely. Yeah. But overall, I mean, it was fascinating to sit down with it because I had to force myself to spend time with it instead of moving to the next album or going somewhere. So it, it was fun to actually pay attention to the songs in depth, get a little bit more feeling for them. Yeah. So we'll go through it and see what you think of each song. And Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that's, uh, you know, I, I was particularly looking forward to this one, uh, not just because of the shirt, <laughs> but... Um... <laughs> I, it's kind of the same way for me. It was it was uh, one of their albums. I mean, there there are, are many other albums, especially as we get to some of the middle and later period. That oh my gosh, I know every word. I know every yeah. every note, every beat, everything, mm -hmm. because I've just been obsessed with them for so so much yeah. of my life. Um, whereas this one kind of just I knew it, but I didn't know it. Hundred percent uh, agree. Yeah. So. For me, I was particularly excited to dive into this one, like you said. So, that being said, let's dive into this one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so, let me lead us through here. Uh, Feeling Gravity's Pull is the first song. Uh, now, you know how I sometimes talk about that purposeful dissonance? Purposeful dissonance? Yeah. I already knew it when I was driving and listening to this. I said, this is that purposeful dissonance he's always talking about. Yeah, yeah. see, there you yeah. go. <laughs> Uh, I think it's one of the best examples I've ever heard on an album of purposeful dissonance. Um, just that it's, it's so that, that guitar, not even just the notes he's playing, which is the dissonance, yeah. but the, the sound that they got and just the way it was recorded um, and how they kind of rakes over the strings in certain parts where it sounds like a, like almost like a locomotive. Uh, very, very cool. Um, you know, Peter Buck himself even makes note of that. Uh, he was quoted as saying, I like the fact that this is a real queasy song. Like it makes you feel like if you were on like those tilt whirl or teacup things at the carnival, you know, yeah. where it's, like, it's with the word I find to use it for this song in, in a good way. Cause I really like the song. Um, it's unsettling. It's kind of unsettling. <laughs> well, see, and again, I'm a very positive REM fan. There's not much you'll ever hear me say negative, but I'm not a big roller coaster fan. And this song was queasy for me. I'm learning okay. I'm not a fan of dissident. What is it? 
purposeful, purposeful dissonance. dissonance. Yeah. I don't love that. I don't love yeah. that by any band anywhere. Anytime I've heard it, it, it doesn't hit my ears right. It doesn't sound right. And my brain gets mad about it. Yeah. And then I can't focus. So this yeah. is actually my least favorite REM song that we've reviewed up to this point. Really? Yeah. And it's it's just because of that that dissonance that you're talking about. It's yeah. It's very unsettling to my ears and it makes, you know, it's a struggle to listen to. Wow. Okay. Um I I'm different. I, I actually enjoy this song. Um I think, you know, after you know, I keep saying murmur then reckoning and then this one, fables, it's like People were waiting though. What's this one going to sound like? They change producers. They, mm-hmm. They've been on the road. They're a bigger band. You know, they're a bigger name now. What, what are they going to do? Where are they going to go? <laughs> and I think, I think to throw them this queasy, unsettling curveball to start this album, I think is actually uh, quite a brilliant move, um, in my opinion. Um, and you I know, don't think it's bad. Don't get me wrong. This is not yeah. me. I think for a lot of people, this probably sits just fine. This is just a personal. I have a struggle with the notes the way it's played. It just, like he says, it is queasy. And I just, for some reason, it's, I don't sit well with it. <laughs> That's yeah. That's personal thing. Yeah. 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 Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it, it's intentionally queasy. I guess it's doing its job if it, if it, uh, it, it does. Makes you want to run to the restroom. No, but, but, uh, <laughs> but the, there's a lyric in here. It says, time and distance are out of place here. Um, and I think Stipe is referring to that setting in North London, um, you know, where they were kind of not in their element. The weather was kind of crappy. They were kind of yeah. on each other. Um, so I think it came through. Um, but I found it interesting that uh, Stipe told his friend, uh, someone you may have heard of, Natalie Merchant. Oh, yes. Um, he said to her uh, that the song was one of his real gut spillers. Um, so as far as the lyrics, he just, you know, kind of he sometimes hmm. refers to as that vomit style of just kind of like getting getting it all out, you know, on tape. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, yeah, there's something really interesting and unique and unexpected about this, uh, especially as an album opener for them on the third album. So I, I quite enjoy it, yeah. Okay, yeah. But it's good, yeah. I mean, this is why we do this. If we're all just, <laughs> and, you know, I, I thought about going into talking about this album too, where it's, you know, there's some... So twists and turns and some unexpected things and you know for i think for both of us some some of it works some of it doesn't sure. um but i think that's good to talk about because if this entire series for all the 15 albums were every song we just say oh, oh. my god that's fantastic it's like this would be so boring <laughs> it would, that would make no sense there's nobody yeah. that agrees on every single song and this yeah. just happens to be an rm song i don't sit well with and which is rare yeah yeah it is rare i mean <laughs> yeah, they are so fantastic which is revealing yeah. itself to me as we do this dive even more it's just like oh my gosh is this is this actually my favorite band of all time i mean it's 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 a discussion we'll have maybe on the last episode or a wrap-up episode because it's sure. i'm starting to wonder it that might be it might be the case um <laughs> but anywho uh let's go on to track two that's maps and legends um now this is a more traditional sounding rem song to follow that opening track that is uh, mm-hmm. set, like we said in queasy um a lyric I grabbed in here. Uh, I love the melody on this too, but um, maybe he's caught in the legend. Maybe he's caught in the mood. Maybe these maps and legends have been misunderstood. Um, that's the chorus. Um, I just, I love the way he sings it. I love the lyrics. Um, and Stipe was quoted as saying, you know, about those lyrics in this song. He said, and I'm paraphrasing this quote, but uh, he said, people are like maps. He's like, you look at them, you can lay them out on the table, you can read them. Uh, you know, it's real pretty, it's nice, and it's kind of mysterious, but you can't make heads or tails of it a lot of the time. And then you go down to the key on the map, and you see what things stand for, and then you start to be able to piece things together. He said, that's kind of how people are to me. Um, so, sense. yeah, I thought that was very, very interesting. Um, so, what are your uh, overall thoughts on this song, Brad? This was a highlight for me. This was... Yeah, I was excited when I heard this one. After hearing the first one, where I got nervous, <laughs> yeah, and going after that first song, I'm like, oh man, this is really going to be different. Yeah. But then this song came on, like you said, and it harkened right back to the first two albums. This was just quintessential REM, great lyrics. Now this is going to be an odd, odd point, and everybody's going to be like, "What the hell is he talking about?" <laughs> Mike Mills, his harmonies in this, 
the number one thing I thought, now these people that are watching us, they haven't heard your bands. But you have a sound like Mike Mills. Would you be a good harmony singer in R.E.M.? Me? Yeah. Oh, you, wow. Mike Mills, I think Mike Mills and you have a, a distinct sound on your harmonies. It's funny you say that because he's actually one of uh, what I call my harmony heroes. Okay, well that makes sense. Yeah. Then. So it does make sense. Like, Man, that sounds like Keith in <laughs> harmony. So yeah, that makes well, sense. That's, then. that's that's a fan, that's a that's a very very great compliment. That <laughs> it was just uh, a, a thing that popped in my head as I was listening. Thank you. It gives me something to actually live up to. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, he's yeah, he's such a. He's such a Swiss army knife in that band, you know, um, which we talk about and we'll continue to talk about. Um, this was kind of a, a, a silly thing maybe uh, to mention, but you know how in the chorus how it says, maybe he's whatever, maybe he's whatever. It, for a fleeting moment, it kind of reminded me, you know, that Dawes song from a window seat. Oh yeah. Where, yeah. Maybe he's in town for someone's birthday or maybe he's yeah. blah, 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 uh, the one where he's on the plane. I can hear that. Um, it just reminded me because of the maybes and just kind of, uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. Maybe they them all. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I was wondering, Taylor. No, <laughs> no I'm kidding. But um, so as I switch my notes here to the other side of the paper, obviously I didn't memorize all these facts. <laughs> um, but hey, man, we're going on to the next song, which is was a big song off this album for this band. It's a, mm. a very well known song by the band. Uh, it seems to be a fan favorite too. Obviously, Driver Eight. Um, so you know, Peter Buck even said himself. He said it's kind of the quintessential REM song as far as like the chord changes and you know the the melody and everything. So, and I I would tend to agree with that. Um, the band, the members of the band in Georgia lived near the train tracks, so they heard them all the time. So I think that's why there's there's a couple songs on here that we'll get to uh, this one mainly. Um, that, you know, have to deal with that that train life and, you know, take a break, driver eight, you've been on this uh, road too long. All right, I bet got that lyrics wrong. Something too long. <laughs> <laughs> something, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, and then something about, you know, he talks about reaching their destination. Um, and, you know, by the end of the song, if you follow the lyrics, it don't, doesn't really resolve that they got to the destination, at least yet, which I thought was kind of intriguing as well. Um, but, you know, driver eight, I feel is is a quintessential REM song, like Peter Buck said. It's a standout on the album. How do you feel? 100% the same. I mean, this yeah. is a standout. I mean, as we go along, I'm kind of also creating like a what is the quintessential mixtape that you would create for REM. This yeah. would be on it. This would sure. be on it. Yeah. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Yeah, I mean, this one, I don't want to spend too much time on this one because uh, it's, it's kind of one that people know. And This is a home run, yeah. I mean, this is something that people have experienced in they don't need to talk to too much about this. Yeah. A home run in the number three spot there, I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, so now we get to a, an interesting song, um, Life and How to Live It. I think I'm really going to floor you and hopefully some of the folks at home with some of the information I found out about this song. Um, now, it's one of the more rocking, you know, songs on the album which uh, I think at this spot in the album, you know, it, it was a good place to put it at number four. Um, now, Stipe actually wrote this song about an actual person, which we're going to find a lot on this album, by the way, as we go through this, um, these uh, things that I found out. But there was a man who lived in Athens who lived in a house. Now, picture this. He lived in a house that was divided into two separate apartments. And it was completely different decor, I mean, each each apartment had its own, you know, bathroom, kitchen. So you could live on one side of the house or the other and not have to cross over. Um, so he set it up as two different, you know, parts of his personality, I guess. But even down to the closets that had the clothing, it was a completely different type of clothing in one house, you know, apartment in the house as, as opposed to the other. Um, and, you know, when you then when you know that and you listen to some of these lyrics, when he sings, when you tire of one side, the other suits you best. Um, when you really dive into it and know what it's about. Um, now, this is really interesting. When this man passed away, uh, they found thousands of copies of a self-published book that he wrote. And what do you think the book's title was? Uh, Life and How You Live on How to Live It. Yeah. yeah. So this odd character... Um, 
self-published and printed thousands of copies, had them in boxes in his house, never gave them to anyone. <laughs> and then the book became this big thing after the fact where people were like, like I saw something where on eBay, someone was selling it for like a, a ridiculous amount of money because there's only so many copies. Um, and apparently it's actually a, a pretty good read. Um, but here's a point I want to make, and then I want you to chime in on the song in general, because I'm very interested to hear what you think. Um, I kind of came to the conclusion, generally speaking about the band, in particular Stipe and his lyrics, the observational lyrics that are so rich in detail is the true genius of Michael Stipe as a lyricist, in my opinion. And this mm -hmm. song is a perfect, perfect example of that. Your thoughts? Oh, you're you're correct. I mean, you're never going to look at a Michael Stipe lyric and go, oh, he's singing about that thing. Or, you know what I mean? Like, he, he takes a picture and he completely paints it with words that you would never know exactly where he's drawing that inspiration from. But if you're told what it is, then it all makes sense. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. so I, I agree with you 100% on that. Well, and I tell you, and I'm being serious about this, it's kind of messing with my head a bit doing all this research because... There's kind of that mystery, especially, you know, they say with the early albums where, oh, he's mumbling. We don't understand what he's saying, blah, 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 um, where I'm finding out a lot of these things through research. And I'm wondering. I don't want to say uh, it's a little dramatic to say if it's ruining the song for me, because it doesn't. It's an R.E.M. song. How could it be ruined? <laughs> but um, it's kind of uh, it's kind of interesting because, you know, once you know what where his inspiration was from, you can't unknow it. You know what I mean? So True. it's kind of an interesting, and now, now for all of you, I guess I ruined it for you. <laughs> but no, but that's just something. What What are your thoughts on that? It's like, would you rather not know, or well, I I hope you would like to know because then I have not much more to say in this episode. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, in general, you do because I mean, like you said, the mumble. Like people complain about the mumble lyrics. You get the lyrics after a while. I mean, that's I never understood that. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, they're so discreet and just the narrative is just out there but you you just sing along because you know the words but when you know the story behind it yeah i know what you mean it kind of takes away whatever picture you were painting in your head it scribbles it out and then you paint the real picture yeah so it kind of takes away the fun of your idea of what the song might mean yeah now you know what it does mean but the meanings behind the songs are pretty fascinating so yeah it's not like you're getting these dry stories i mean it's coming from back you know, very, very good uh, subject matter. Yeah, I agree with that part. And, you know, this album in particular, I mean, we didn't get to the other ones yet, but oh, yeah. this album in particular is, you'll find there's more stories like this that are actual people that were lived in Georgia that these guys knew. Mm -hmm. and it's really stipe, you know. Um, so, yeah, I thought it was interesting. Uh, but, yeah, the way he, the way he can take something, you know, where most people would just, you know, hear the story about this guy and be like, oh, that's weird. You know, but he... he <laughs> He makes this whole great song out of it. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, before I knew all this, and I'm still not sure how I feel about it, but it's, it might seem odd, but the, living with the song before I did the research in this week, um, the only part I was unsure I really liked about the song was where he actually sings the title of the song. Because it just seems like it comes out of left field and it's like it was just like thrown in there and it doesn't have much to do with the rest of the song. Just jammed in the place. Yeah, but I guess that was kind of the point, you know. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's the moment where they find all the books, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's like this jarring thing. But uh, anyway, so. Um, but, but I mean, was this kind of just more of a middle of the road track for you in this album? Or was it a standout? Or This this was in the middle, middle of the pack. I mean. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. I mean, this is not the top. I mean, it's not going to top drive rate, of course. Don't expect no. it to. Yeah. But this is also not the low point for me either. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think and, and again, with this one in particular knowing the story, I found it kind of interesting, but mm -hmm. um all right, so let's keep it rolling here, buddy. Uh, let's move on to Old Man Kenzie. Um and again, this is another local real life character uh that serves as the protagonist of this song. Uh Buck said Kenzie would <laughs> was known for kidnapping dogs and holding them for ransom. Um <laughs> And then Stipe said of this man that he would play dead in a coffin and then his buddy would bring uh, usually a female over uh, to look and then he would open his eyes and jump up and scare people. And they, they had lots of fun with that. So a uh, very interesting character. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
um, especially to write a song about. Um, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, there's some more of this, to me, kind of purposeful dissonance and a little bit of a, not as much as uh, Feeling Gravity's Pull, but there's a little mm -hmm. bit of an unsettling vibe to this song. Did you pick up on that? 100%, which is another reason this one's on the lower end for me. <laughs> It's that purposeful yeah. dissonance. I mean, I struggle with it. I don't know what it is about it. I mean, I know what it is now that you've explained it to me. Yeah. But in the most instances that I've heard it, it doesn't sit well with my ear. So, same problem. Yeah. And, you know, um, it's it's when, you know, that dissonance is when there's the note that you expect to come, and then there's the note that actually comes, which is usually a little bit below it. And that's what kind of makes, the you know, the hairs on your neck uh -huh. stand up ears perk um you know yeah what, I, I can't tell if it's in tune if i'm hearing something wrong yeah it, yeah it frustrates yeah, well, my ears and that's why i always make sure i use the term as a purposeful because oh yeah yeah um yeah as long as it's not overused um well i'll tell you what i mean you know we're gonna have uh the the wilco uh album i'm not sure where we're gonna post what uh, but the new wilco album cousin and wilco's career in general there's a lot of purposeful dissonance in, on Wilco albums. Sure. Um, so, um, so um, I guess if this were the vinyl, we're flipping over to uh, the next side. Which is called? Oh, uh, wait. On this one, it was... Uh, oh, I think, from what I remember, the, side, the first side was called A side, like the A side. Yep, and then the is. second one was called Another Side. Is that right? <laughs> You're right. I did see that, yeah. Yep. I didn't check my... Well, you know what? By the way, thanks for reminding me. <laughs> I have my vinyl copy right here, folks. Look at that. Well, it should say it right there in front of you, then. Um, you know what? If you indulge me a moment here, I am going to check. Why don't you start telling the folks what you think about Can't Get There From Here while I get this vinyl out of here? <laughs> now, see, look, first, let's watch how gentle he is with these vinyls. I've had yeah. people on this channel yeah. beat me for how... How rough I am on vinyls. It does say, I don't know if you can see it, but it does say another yeah, side. It does. Yep. That's pert. That's great. They they love yeah. to mess with the, the yeah. wording on the side, which is great. What was the what was the last one? Was it L and R? Or? Uh man, was it L and R? It might have been. It might I think been it was left and right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're so clever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, what do you uh, what do you think about "Can't Get There from Here," buddy? As, well, a, as starting off uh, side uh, another <laughs> another side. I mean, I'm, I'm curious to hear what it's about, honestly. Okay. Right. Yeah, I'm, well, let me see what I found out about that. I don't know if I found too much about the meaning per se. Um, okay. I just have I just have here that it's you know uh, it's been described as a surprise foray into kind of funk inspired soul. Um, as much as R.E.M. would do uh, to start the second half of the album. Um, uh, for me, it's arguably one of the most memorable songs on the entire album. Mm -hmm. um, and again, as you is very evident when you listen, Stipe is using multiple ranges and uh, styles to his voice on this track. Yeah. Um, I love that verse, you know, when the world is a monster, you know, and he's singing real low yeah. and then he does that. You know, that high thing in the chorus. <laughs> Um, it's really quite a wide range, not even just the technical range of the notes it's itself, but uh, just the stylistic range. Um, yeah. I find the song to be very interesting, uh, very upbeat, uh, and very fun. Uh, mm -hmm. and a great way to start a side of an album, really. I agree. This is, yeah. this would be on the upper end of the, the album for me. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I think this song is pretty well known among R.E.M. fans, too. It is, yeah. Seems to be a standout. Uh, what I mean, I don't know how long this this cassette of this mixtape you're talking about ends up being, but do you think this would make your tape? Well, no. Okay. Because I'm keeping my, my tape to about 12 tracks, I think. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I'm going to do like six and six, you know, six on side A, six on side another side, whatever. Yeah. I'm going to call it. So, no, probably not. This would not make tape. Yeah. So you, not think bad. Not no. Think bad. So, you're saying you would make this mixtape for like all of their career? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you got to be real choosy. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's choosy. So far, what do I have on? I have, uh, can't remember what I put on from Reckoning. I had something on Reckoning on there. South uh, Central Rain? Yes. Yeah. So, so far, you got South Central Rain. I've got Driver 8. 
I don't think I had anything from Murmur, did I? Uh, I no, I don't. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think I remember you mentioning it. So you wouldn't, yeah. you wouldn't put Radio Free Europe on. That that's not my no. Okay. No. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um. All right. Well, let's get back to some fables here, buddy. Um. The next song, Green Grow the Rushes. Um. So I think I'm sure you're curious to know what this one is uh, getting at. <laughs> um. It's really a folk protest song disguised by a delicate, pretty melody and instrumentation, if you think about it. Um, if you pick up on the lyrics where he sings the amber waves of gain instead of grain. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, Stipe came out and said it's really essentially about the plight of Mexican workers in the United States. Um, and another lyric, you know, where he sings surplus cheaper hands. So, I mean, it's it's pretty overt uh what he's talking sure. about i mean this band has been known to get political at times um uh, but not even just as much political more just uh humanity you know um yeah. but yeah i mean the melody uh the song itself the way it presents on record i think is gorgeous oh it's beautiful it's a beautiful song yeah i mean i've told you in the past i'm not a big political song fan yeah no matter what side of the aisle you're on i just Politics to me just blah. I like the music to me is my escape from any kind of politics or life. Or, yeah. So I, you know, I get it. I get the uh, the idea of a uh, protest song though. I mean, it's part of the world you live in. And, you know, you're going to sing about certain things. Yeah. This is one where I just kind of threw out the meaning and just listened to the song. I, you know, it's beautiful. Like you said, it's a beautiful song. Yeah, and I, you know, I think this one was more like you said, uh, as as opposed to political, it's just trying to trying to. Uh, take a closer look and shine a light on uh, things that should be addressed and um, hopefully, you know, corrected um, yeah. where, where people aren't being treated the way they should be. And this one, don't get me wrong. This is definitely not the kind of political song where it's yeah, yeah. offensive or, or over. This is a nicely done song. It's just, you know, I wouldn't say it's bad, badly done political. No, no. Um, I mean, it's not like it's Bush Leaker by Pearl Jam, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we're gonna move on to the next one here, buddy. It's uh, I put I put actually how to pronounce it, so I didn't mess this up. But it's that's a good idea. Kohotek. Kohotek. Let me make sure I said that right. Uh, yeah. But now this is another example of Stipe's what I call cerebral songwriting. Um, Kohotek was actually a comet that was predicted to hit Earth in 1974, the year of my birth, um, but missed us by a, wa a large distance, thank goodness. <laughs> um, but the lyric says, like Kohotek, you were gone. So, you know, this to me is just another example of him taking something that, you know, these guys are very well read. They were the, you know, the college guys that met in college, they had the trench coats and they, you know, I'm sure they were into like, you know, reading the fine novels of, of, of years gone by and things like that, which is which is fine. I mean, I know we know lots of bands like Radiohead, for example, they're very well read and uh, some of that, some of their intelligence, quite frankly, which is a compliment, uh, seeps into their songwriting and their lyrics, which I think is uh, quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, but to take that comment um and relate it to what's going on with, with him and, you know, in a relationship in this song, that juxtaposition and that um, innovation actually really in a, a, a way to blend those two together. Um, I, I think, I think works really well on the song. It does. Yeah. Michael is a deep thinker. You can tell that yes. in general. Yeah. Um, not even just the collegian version where he's just sitting there with books. I think this guy just sits and thinks like I can picture him sitting on a, on a porch swing. Just, <laughs> thinking you know and yeah. so i think a lot of that just seeps out i mean when he's just writing yeah. a song it's just things that are going through his head just come out naturally so yeah what well, seems like big weird you know ideas and themes are just probably what's in the guy's brain yeah no and you know and we know uh of course with michael stipe you know uh during rem and now after rem he's very uh involved he loves to do photography mm -hmm. um he's uh been involved with uh films um, so he's he's a true a renaissance man, a true artist, not just I mean, and if you were just the lead singer of R.E.M., that would be, <laughs> be quite enough, be quite yeah. enough. For me. Uh, but he, he is more than that. So um, 
All right, we're coming down the home stretch here, buddy. Um, the next song is Auctioneer, parentheses, Another Engine. Another Auction. Yeah, there it goes. Another, another Engine, what? Yeah, another, well, yeah, Auctioneer, an auction. Another Engine. That's all right. Yeah, Engine. But, you know, it just struck me that Another Engine is on another side. Yep. <laughs> side B. So, um, but this... This is another candidate, in my opinion, for the most rocking song on the album. Oh, it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, Stipe, uh, here we go with the train again. Stipe actually rode it on a train when he couldn't sleep. Um, and again, there's some, there's a bit of purposeful dissonance in this one too, buddy. So we'll have to see how it sits with you. Um, but I thought this song was energetic and propulsive. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it's funny because I went into this. <laughs> thinking like this was one of their quite frankly weaker albums and i'm starting to question that but we'll get more into more of that at the end um but yeah what are your thoughts on auctioneer i enjoyed this song and i think the dissonance that we're talking about i'm noticing what it is more of a, this is more of an upbeat rock like you said yeah and i think the dissonance not say is hidden but it's it's filled out around a lot heavier to where it's not smacking me in the face. Yeah. Where the other songs were like, you put the guitar in my face and it's playing these <laughs> dissonance. So, but this, you can hear it, but it wasn't like, hey, pay attention to me only. You know, like. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't mind it as much in this song. I thought the song was actually really good. And this would have been in the top half again. Before. Okay. Yeah. So the dissonance is there, but it seems less overt and less distracting for you. In this exactly. Song, right? Yeah. Okay. Good, good, good. Uh, yeah. I thought this was a good. Good track, definitely. Um, so we got two more here. Uh, we're up to Good Advices. Uh, now, this is a poignant ballad about homesickness. Um, and also, if you follow the lyrics, it also touches upon the topic of infidelity while you're on the road. Yep. Um, so there's a lyric. Uh, I like the way this kind of, you know, knowing that that's what it's about. Uh, this, this is pretty cool. Where he sings, home is a long way away. At the end of the day, when there are no friends, when there are no lovers, who are you going to call for? So, yeah, it's uh, pretty interesting. And I can imagine it's probably a well-said statement by someone who's been on the road. I mean, it's yeah, just the way you said it. I'm like, yeah, that's true. I mean, you're on the road for a lot of time. So, I mean, probably is a, that probably is a, you always hear about the, the infidelity on the road and think, what dicks? But yeah. It's tricky, you know. I mean, it's it's a that's a whole weird lifestyle. It is, you know, and, and it's true of athletes too. We know, yep. Um, you know, but uh, I, I I like the song. I like the song quite a bit. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of I've always thought of this. You know, when you reach that level of fame, and this, you know, they they you know got way more famous after you know several albums after this, but um, when you have that, when you're on stage. And you're kind of in this like, I don't want to say a uh, Petri dish, but you're kind of in the, on this like showcase and all the adulation. And then you go back to the hotel room and it's nothing. Mm -hmm. There's no one. Um, and you you just, I, th I would think in some ways you kind of just wish you were a regular person. You would have to, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it would be kind of a mind F to be super oh, famous. Sure. Certainly. So, yeah, as luckily for me, I guess as hard as I tried at one point in my life, it didn't happen. So maybe maybe it was a good thing. Maybe it was a good thing. <laughs> hey, there's always time. There's always time. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, so uh, who do we end with here, buddy? Well, what's it, who is this? Is this a famous guy? Wendell G. Is he famous? Well, you know, uh, let's find out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, now this, well, first of all, let me just say, this is a pensive, mournful, and gorgeous ballad. It is. Opinion. Uh, beautiful. Um, now there's an entire small town near the train station there in Georgia with a bunch of shops all almost in a row, really. And they all have the last name G. There's like, um. I'm trying to think what it was. It was like a, I don't know if I have this right, but uh, there was like a, a bowling alley and there was like a restaurant. Uh, there was a, a cleaners or whatever. And they were all in a row and they all had the last name G, G-E-E. -E. 
Um, so it was almost like this whole, this family kind of ran the whole, the business okay. of an entire town, which is kind of interesting. Um, so that's where all this comes from. Um, but yeah, the you know, older man, you know, there's the one lyric where it says there wasn't even time to say goodbye. So it's kind of about his life and, you know, living in that town and just being, you know, uh, a, a namesake of the town, so to speak. Um, and then of course, you know, he eventually passes on. So kind of a, kind of a fitting way to end the album, you know, as a kind of wrap things up with the, you know, just like the end of something. And this is the end of this person's life, unfortunately, but, um, again, Stipe just being observational and, and taking something that he sees, uh, he kind of ingests it and, and out comes this beautiful song. Yep. No, oh, I agree. It's this is definitely beautiful. REM. REM once in a while hits that. Yeah. That that moment where you're like, wow, that's gorgeous. This is them again. I mean, they can do that. They can do the rock. They can do folk. This is this is in the wheelhouse of the beautiful part. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just right off the top of my head, especially because it seems to be the anniversary of this album. There's a lot uh, I see on my phone lately about the REM album Up. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, when you talk about beautiful REM. Um, that song, uh, I think it's called At My Most Beautiful, uh, where mm -hmm. they sing, I found a way to make you smile. Oh, Bless yeah. You. Bless you. Oh, you see um, that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing gets by me. Um, that's just one of the, I mean, well, geez, there's so many. There's oh. so many. I mean, country feedback so and strange currencies and mm -hmm. so many. We'll, we'll get to all of them <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> eventually. Uh, but let's do final thoughts on this album, man. This was so interesting for me personally. I'm sure it was for you to not be quite as familiar with this one. And, you know, we. by the way, when we did our ranking, uh, our initial ranking, we had this at number nine of the 15. Okay. And, and then we had Accelerate at 10. And as we were wrapping up, we decided to put Accelerate above this. Okay. That's the one change we made. So we actually bumped this down to 10 out of their 15 albums. Um, the hard thing is, you know, this album is important to their, you know, timeline as a band. And it's very interesting with a different producer. Um, there's more standout songs in this album than I realized. Um, but where do you put it? I mean, you know, it's kind of fair to put it at 10 when we know what's coming. We all know what's coming. That's, you know. that's why you just surprised me when you said that, because that, this is a bad album. This is, again, this is one of these few bands in the world that just can't make a bad album. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure if I said, Mike, well, make a bad album, he could probably do it. <laughs> but it would be a hilarious, intentional effort. Yeah. But there's got to be albums that are towards the lower half just based on certain things. For me, this is based on the production and the cohesiveness. Something about the songs didn't feel... Like Murmur and Reckoning, they just seem to have this flow to them. This yeah. album was a little juxtaposed to me. It didn't feel quite as smooth going through. Yeah. And then you add that that production layer into it. This is definitely of the three, the bottom of the three. Not yes. to say it's a bad album, but it's just it's not Murmur or Reckoning by any means. Exactly. So we'll, well see. Yeah. We'll see what happens going forward with it. But as of now, I can see where the flaws were that held me back from it. There's a lot of beauty on the album, too. I mean, it's R.E.M. You're going to have great stuff. <laughs> yeah. But it's not Murmur or, or Reckoning. And we got a Life's Bridge pageant coming up next. We'll see uh, how that mm. all stacks up. But yeah. yeah. But I enjoyed the visit. I did, too. Immensely. Yeah. I mean, this. I think of all the ones we're going to do for this entire discology of R.E.M., this is the one where I was like, man, I'm really glad I'm diving in because I don't feel like I know it as well as I should, which is ironic because it's the only shirt I have for Varia. <laughs> yeah, um, I yeah. agree, though. This was the album I was least comfortable going into. Yeah, which is interesting that there was the same album for both of us because they have 15 albums, you know? Yeah. I wonder why that is that we both... Uh, I don't know. Well, I know... Well, I don't want to spoil anything for Life Search Pageant, so never mind, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I almost did. But, folks... Um, Please, uh, we have so much fun doing this series. If you're a big REM fan or if you're kind of a more casual fan, but you've always wanted to like know more, dive in, I think this is a perfect series for you. So please go back and check out our first two episodes, Murmur and Reckoning. We hope you enjoyed Fables of the Reconstruction here. Uh, weigh in in the comments. What are your thoughts on this album? 
Um, do you already, are you already thinking ahead of the next band we're going to do with this technology? If you want to make some suggestions, we'll certainly take them under consideration. We've already discussed a few that might be in the running, like Oasis and things like that. So we'll, we'll see what we decide. Uh, it's going to take a while to get through the rest of these albums. We've got 12 more to go. So we're 20% of the way there. So we're looking um, at about three months till completion. Yeah. If we stay on our schedule yeah. through the holidays and everything. So we'll try our best. <laughs> So, again, folks, thank you so much. Uh, I know these these videos tend to be longer, but that's the nature of doing a deep dive. So for the ones of you that are watching them and are taking this journey with us, uh, we can't thank you enough. Um, this, you know, we couldn't have thought of a better band to start the series with. Um, so let us know, you know, in particular, what you think of this album. This is, you know, you know, uh, several different sources that I read said, you know, this was the difficult third album. Um, so what do you think? Um, is is there beauty in in the in the difficulty for you? Um, is this uh, something that is kind of on the lower end for you? But like we said, is there a bad REM album? I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> I heard, well, everybody keeps saying around the sun, but we're gonna we're gonna check that one out again. Yeah, we're gonna take a closer look at that. Yeah. Time may be uh, more friendly to that in retrospect, yeah. but we'll we'll see. Um, so thank you, folks. Um, as always, for Brad, I am Keith. This is the KMB Music Den. Please like this video, share it on social media, subscribe to the channel, and smash the bell for notifications. Uh, viva REM! And we will be back <laughs> real soon with Life's, Life's Pageant. Rich Pageant. Oh, yeah. I cannot wait. So listen to it with us, guys. Listen to it leading up to the next video so yeah. you can chime in and really soak it all in and be like, oh, yeah, I remember hearing that in that song. Um, I think it'll you'll have a better experience with these videos if you listen along with us, and we we would be truly honored if you did, it took the time to do that. So, yep. thanks, Brad. As always, uh, you come prepared, and uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to do this channel with anyone but you, my friend. Same. Appreciate it. All right, we'll see you guys soon. Take care. Bye bye.